Today on the Silver Screen Dudes, we are going to count down and rank, in order of quality, all 10 of the Planet of the Apes movies. The world has gone nuts again for the Apes franchise with the recent release of Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes, and rightfully so. We've done our review for it on the channel, which you can go check out now, link down in the description below. With all that said, looking at this franchise that dates all the way back to 1968, you have to argue that this is one of the most successful franchises of all time and has got a generation setting defining love. Doesn't matter if what, what, what decade you were born in, there seems to be a resonance with the themes and the narrative of this franchise. And I'm one of the many who adore it. And now today, as we're going through these movies, it has to be stated right off the bat, stating the obvious, especially when it comes to the old movies. Well, one, we're going to be talking spoilers, but the other thing that I think has to be stated right off the bat, and I'm going to try and not repeat it too much throughout the video, the old movies are dated. There's no escaping that fact. It is very, very clearly people in prosthetics and in costume, not the best costumes, but what I invite everyone to do, especially if you're sort of an 80s, 90s baby like myself and, you know, you've grown up with the modern special effects. Don't be put off by the old movies. Allow yourself to suspend disbelief a little bit. Don't get drawn into the whole, oh, but the apes look so bad. Yeah, they do. There's no escaping that fact. But what the stories are doing, the narrative that is being told, the overarching story, the characters that are involved with the older movies, and some of the twists, man, it's genuinely really, really good stuff despite the aged effects and prosthetics and costumes. So allow yourself to just be drawn into the story and don't get bogged down with the whole, oh, but it looks dated. Yes, yeah, sure. But a lot of old things look dated and are still great. So go with that and go and enjoy these old movies if you haven't seen them. And with all that said, let's get into the ranking and I'm going to now hopefully give you some reasons as to why you should go and see these old movies. Starting right off the bat with the original 1968, The Planet of the Apes with Charlton Heston. This movie is sensational. The story is very simple. You've got these sp space explorers, a group of three, four actually, and they do a little bit of exposition at the beginning of the movie to try and wrap you into, you know, the, the, the non-linearity of time and how it's possible that time in one place can be different to time in another place. All stuff you would have seen in more modern movies like Interstellar, of course. And it doesn't take a long time to go into that. It just kind of states it very quickly in a matter-of-fact way, blink and you'll miss it type thing. Anyway, they crash land on this planet. They don't think it's Earth. They think they're on some foreign planet. But the air can be breathed. The water seems fresh. And lo and behold, wouldn't you know, after exploring for a little bit, they get attacked by apes on horses, <laughs> which was awesome. Apes on horses. So some of them get lobotomized. Some of them just get killed outright. And our hero, played by none other than the great Charlton Heston, who gets shot in the throat. So he got talk, which is a huge part because the humans on this planet can't seem to talk. The apes are the intelligent beings, not the humans. But Charlton Heston, he's got the ability to write, he's got the ability to talk, he gets captured, and he starts conversing with the two main apes, uh, Zira and Cornelius. Cornelius played by the great Roddy McDowell, who pretty much appears, not pretty much, he does appear in all of the five original apes movies, so he's going to be a recurring character. The voice does come back. Charlton Heston is able to speak. And the first time he speaks is obviously when you get that iconic get your stinking paws off me, you damn dirty ape. It's brilliant. And that kind of first time speaking is something that's always been popular in the Planet of the Apes. This first movie, it ends with Cornelius played by Ronald McDowell and Charlton Heston sort of coming to a, a mutual respect, a mutual understanding. Charlton Heston's allowed to leave. He goes along the beach with Nova, played by Linda Harrison, Bella. And you get to the iconic, the crumbled Statue of Liberty, implying that we were in a nuclear holocaust, humankind has been phased out, and apes have arisen to take our place. 
And it ends with that iconic shot of Charlton Heston, half in the sea, hands up in the air in Christ's pose, going, damn you all to hell, realizing what's happened. And it ends on that epic cliffhanger. It's just brilliant. Thematically, the overarching message about what it has to say about nuclear holocaust, the character interactions in this movie, there is no doubt that the original Planet of the Apes is an A-ranking movie. I love everything about this movie. Yes, it's aged, but it is a sensational piece of filmmaking. Fast forward two years to Beneath the Planet of the Apes. Now, Charlton Heston never returned to Earth, so they send someone to find him. That someone in this case? played by James Franciscus. Now, when he lands on the planet of the apes, in the aim of finding Charlton Heston, he stumbles across Nova, Linda Harrison. So she's got a new man who she can huddle up to. The character of Nova is very poorly written. Like she, it's literally hot woman who doesn't say anything for two movies. It's aged. That side is, is like not good at all. And of course they're gonna say, yeah, but the humans don't talk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You've cast a pretty girl in a non-talking role. For modern sensibilities, people are gonna look at this and go, WTF. James Franciscus arrives and he's trying to figure out where is Charlton Heston, what's happened. And he very much goes through the same rigmarole that Charlton Heston went through, you know, gets captured by the apes. He runs into Cornelius, Ronnie McDowell again. But this time, they continue on that journey past the Statue of Liberty and they find this cave system and they go, as the title implies, beneath the planet of the apes. And beneath the planet of the apes, they find a talking human race, hyper-intelligent, almost psychic-like. And they try to understand just how has mankind got to this stage. And you very quickly find out that yes, the nuclear holocaust happened, the ape shows up and a remnant of human survivors made their way underground and remained intelligent. And they have one atomic bomb left. One atomic bomb big enough to level the entire planet, which is used as a failsafe. Now in the background of all this, the gorillas, those damn gorillas who seem to be, uh, who are going to be a continuous theme throughout these movies, They've been doing their own little uprising and they want to take control of the apes. They want to be the leaders. And of course they chase James Franciscus down. They storm. I'm not giving away too much here because there's a few really interesting plot points that happen when they're beneath the planet of the apes. I really do want you to go and watch them. There's characters that come back. There's characters that die. Things that really make you go, whoa, okay, they went there, fair play. And yeah. Ultimately, I have to give away the ending here for the sake of continuing this ranking. The gorillas break in, they kill most of the human race. James Franciscus gets killed and in his dying moment, he hits that nuclear button. He hits the big red button and it ends with the planet being eviscerated. So one would think that is the end of the Planet of the Apes franchise. Oh, no, 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 no. But where does this movie stand? It's not quite as good as the original, but do you know what? Considering I was missing Charlton Heston for most of this movie, it still kept me engaged and I was along for the ride. I loved it. And I'm going to give this movie a B ranking. It's fun. Same problems as the previous one with the effects and all that. But they went in a really interesting direction. And one would think with the way that narrative ended so abruptly with the planet going bye bye, you think, well, that's it. No, it's not. Because that brings us on to Escape from the Planet of the Apes. Now, viewer be warned. It gets weird now. Really, really weird. It opens on planet Earth, not on the planet of the apes, because that is no more. And planet Earth welcomes this fallen spaceship. Now you think, who is it that's coming to Earth? Turns out it's the apes. Roddy McDowell, so Cornelius, Zira, and one of their companions whose name I can't remember. Three of them, but he's one of the super hyper intelligent apes. Three of them have escaped before the planet was destroyed and they've made their way to Earth. The reason this movie gets weird is because I get what they were going for. They kind of wanted to flip the script on its head. Aside. So we've seen what it would be like if a hyper-intelligent human landed on a planet where the apes were hyper-intelligent. How would that existing society respond to an outside threat? It's basically the same thing here, but it, it, it worked better having sort of man from outer space landing with apes because you've got that, you know, uncanny valley feeling. Here it's like, this just feels odd. You've got Zira being dressed up in sort of Chanel. You've got them going shopping and you've got them going to NATO and giving talks about 
their home planet to what happened to it. You've got them drinking champagne. It just felt like, this is weird now. Like, And for the whole movie, I'm like, where are we going with this? Like, but kind of what's the point here? What are we getting at? Ah, and that's where we get to. So it transpires that Cornelius and Zira's child is supposedly going to be the one who will start the ape revolution and the ape uprising. And the humans cotton on to this. And obviously that means that, well, at best, what we're going to do is neuter Cornelius and Zira. So they can't have said baby. At worst, we're going to kill them. Problem. Zira's already pregnant. And now the humans are after the apes. And yeah, look, I'm going to give away a major thing at the end here. Major. Because it shocked me when I saw it. So here I'll put a spoiler warning up. If, if you haven't seen Escape from the Planet of the Apes, this is a hell of a plot point here. Skip ahead to the next section of this video, to the next movie, because I don't want to give away too much here. And I'll try to not repeat the spoiler throughout the video. They die. Like the humans murdered them in cold blood. They're on the run. Cornelius and Zira with their baby, who has now been born. They kill the baby. I was like, what the hell is this movie? And that ending elevates it from being, eh, beh, not as good as the other two. It elevates it up. The ending, th this is a franchise that knows how to stick the landing, man. Like, wow. And this ending really hit hard. And then you get this almighty plot twist. Almighty plot twist. Because it turns out that she swapped babies. She left her intelligent baby with another ape, a, a, a planet Earth ape, in the care of a circus owner played by, <laughs> played by Khan himself, Ricardo Montalban. But yeah, our main ape protagonist just gunned down in cold blood. It's quite vicious. And because that ending is so good, where I was probably thinking this movie's around at sea, sometimes the ending of a movie and the narrative just brings everything together so perfectly that it elevates the movie. And as a result, I'm going to give Escape from the Planet of the Apes a B ranking. It has to be there. That ending is just... This franchise and its endings, man. Ay ay ay, It hits hard. Part 4 now, 1972's Conquest of the Planet of the Apes. Again, weird one. Weird, weird, weird. This is as close as Planet of the Apes got to being kind of dystopian future. It turns out that Zira and Cornelius from their home planet bought something with them, the simian flu, which kind of wiped out all cats and dogs on the planet. So mankind in its infinite wisdom has taken it upon itself to want to groom apes into being its new pets. So, I mean... It's dumb. Like, you have to go with this. It is dumb. You've got that one remaining ape, the son of Cornelius and Zira, who is called... <laughs> if you've seen the new ones, you'll get this. Caesar. Caesar is it. Caesar is not as peaceful as his father. Caesar is angry about the way humankind treats apes. Caesar has got a superiority complex. Caesar is going to see to it that the apes rise up. Here's the problem though. He's the only intelligent ape. However, as I said, mankind is trying to bring apes to a place where they can't only just be the human's pets, but kind of human slaves, kind of like what they were doing in iRobot. It's very much that sort of vibe where robots are subservient to humans. They do house chores, picking the kids up. They're trying to teach apes to do all of that madness. Now, fair play to 1972 to try to do something like this, but it is bonkers mad, this one. Y you have to kind of just go with it um of all of the originals this was the hardest one for me to get through because the idea it's just so out there man like it, it's a really zany idea you've got all of these facilities which are kind of not breeding the apes but educating the apes and torturing the apes into submission so that they comply and learn things and caesar sees all this and he's like not on my watch and he makes the apes rise up with him none of them can talk he's still the only one who talks but they understand him and they understand that he's one of them but he's intelligent so he becomes their natural leader and the movie kind of culminates with an ape rise up but it, it, it's very condensed. It's not like the apes have taken over the world. It's like they've taken over the facility. Caesar gives this big rousing speech where he's initially saying that, look, 
humans have done us dirty. We're going to now do them dirty. One of his human advisors says to him, you said this isn't the route you would go down. And he, he, he ends up, he ends up kind of backtracking immediately. And the movie ends with him saying, we are going to see this rise of the planet of the apes. To perhaps we will become the dominant species, but we will live peacefully with humankind. Weird, slow, hard to get through, quite ham-fisted. This one gets a C from me. It didn't hit as hard as I wanted it to. It didn't have the big holy Christ moments that the previous ones did. It, it's fine. Like, it, it's a necessary step to advance the narrative, but it gets a C. It, it, yeah. Yeah. And so we finish the original franchise with 1973's Battle for the Planet of the Apes. And again, it's weird because obviously we continue the narrative from the last one. We're still on planet Earth. Ape society has risen the way Caesar wanted for no reason at all. No explanation. He's managed to teach all the apes to talk. <laughs> like, that's a very big pill to swallow. They learn to speak by osmosis, by just being around him. But it's fine. You suspend this belief, you go with it. Much like beneath the planet of the apes, you find out that there's a remnant of humankind who have become all disfigured and dismorphed. The effects here are really poor. It's basically just some warts on the face. And they're vengeful. And Caesar has created a kind of semi-utopian society whereby the humans and apes are living peacefully side by side, but apes are very, very much the dominant species. It culminates in a battle between the humans that were living underground and the apes. And I felt sorry for it because I think that with the idea that they had in this movie, if it had been executed in a modern time, the end piece, which they clearly wanted to be a big deal, the end piece would have hit that much harder. But because the budget was visibly small, the big battle which, which we were leading up to didn't feel big, the stakes didn't feel big, the denouement of the battle felt kind of lame, to be honest. And all with the with this aim of, well, yeah, we need to wipe out this remnants of mankind, even though Caesar said we don't wipe out the remnants of mankind. It's those pesky gorillas again who are trying to push a revolution forward. They take over, they want to kill humankind. Caesar uprises against them. He says, no, he lets some of the humans live and we have all this perfect utopian ape humankind society and it ends hundreds of years in the future with the narrative being told Caesar was a great, great ape and he led us all to freedom. End. Weird! And it, it, it feels so far removed from the original Charlton Heston movie, this one. I'm like, I get where you're going. You kind of wanted to bring the narrative full circle. So given that with this is very loosely a time traveling franchise i guess you wanted to bring it to a place where if you were doing a time loop and you got to a place now where charlton heston was to arrive back maybe it would fit but it also kind of doesn't because apes and humans are living peacefully together it's weird i can't really give this movie anything more than a c um some interesting ideas let down by majorly let down by a budget and it should have been longer than none of these apes movies are long they're all sort of an hour and a half length. This one, I feel, needed a little bit more time to breathe and it suffered as a result of it. So it's a C ranking for Battle for the Planet of the Age. Oh, and then it gets bad, man. It's bad, 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 bad. The remake, the Tim Burton starring Mark Wahlberg and Tim Roth and Michael Clark Duncan, RIP, big man. I think Helena Bonham Cast is in this too. The remake for Planet of the Apes. Mark Wahlberg plays the Charlton Heston character. They basically follow beat for beat the same thing that the Charlton Heston movie did. Where I will give it credit, I actually think that the final battle in this movie, considering it's 2001, was pretty good. This special effect, modern special effects hadn't come to a place yet where we could do anything other than put people in ape costumes. The ape costumes were actually a nice... Listen, it, this is a franchise where people are in ape costumes before the modern, before the modern franchise kicks in, yeah? So, in the, judging it in that scope, these costumes are actually pretty good. They're obviously, you know, considering it's 40 years later, a massive step up from the original movies. You still kind of skip the feeling that, man, it's 2001 and I'm watching people in ape costumes. But the fur, the pro facial prosthetics, it was good. Tim Roth was a decent villain. The final battle was pretty good. 
They swapped out, you know, Mark Wahlberg escapes the planet. They don't have the damn you all to hell. But he gets back home and he sees that, he sees that the Lincoln Memorial has been replaced with the silhouette, with the, with the face of an ape, the Tim Roth ape. And it's like, okay, so you've kind of done something adjacent slash parallel. But you know, man, this movie just didn't work. I get what it was going for. Fantastic soundtrack, by the way. An update on the prosthetics, but an update and a retelling, it's not enough. This is, for me, this is the worst in the entire franchise. This one gets a solid, unabashed D ranking. It doesn't really have many redeeming features. The fact that the 1968 version with all of its prior 40 year constraints was so much better than this one is a further condemnation on just how vapid this movie is. From zero to hero, Rise of the Planet of the Apes was a masterpiece. And I do not throw that word around lightly. Right off the bat, I want to tell you, of all of the Planet of the Apes movies, this is my favorite. We're in a post Lord of the Rings world, post King Kong world. We know what the geniuses at the Weta Workshop can do. We know how freaking good Andy Serkis is at motion capture. James Franco hadn't become public enemy number one yet. And it just had this brilliant side selection of cars with the likes of John Lithgow, David Oyelowo, Weta backing up the digital production. It was like, how would a Planet of the Apes movie look in a modern perspective? And you know what? Send sensational and i love the fact that we didn't have to do space exploration in this one this is very much a man-made problem which i love little baby a call caesar to the hat gets exposed becomes hyper intelligent he gets raised by james franco's family and by having such a close bond with humankind he has an affinity and love and respect for humankind because he's seen the good that humankind is capable of. But he grows up, he gets put into captivity, and then you see the bad. He sees the bad that humankind is capable of. And just a way that Charlton Heston's first line sent shivers down people's spines because it's when he first speaks in the original movie. One word here. And a word that frankly was incre- I should have mentioned this, was incredibly important in Conquest for the Planet of the Apes because what the apes hated being called in the original franchise, being told was no, because that's what the humans were saying when they were doing something wrong, no. And they kind of harken back to that. The first words that Caesar speaks, first word even, no, I will never forget. You could hear a pin drop in the cinema. He's so convincing Andy Serkis in getting you to buy in that he's playing an ape that you almost forget that, hey, you're in a Planet of the Apes movie. These apes are going to talk at some point. And so when that moment happens, it is so powerful, so vivid. The cinema I was in went dead quiet and that elevated the moment even more because you were getting a collective emotional reaction to something. I love this movie. It ends with Caesar having led some apes to escape. The apes are becoming intelligent now. You see that there's rise of something called the simian flu, which is messing with humans and making the apes intelligent and that's how the movie ends this is the best in the franchise for me this is immediately s ranking this is a goated movie if you wanted to convince someone who was reluctant to watch a planet of the apes movie start with this one it is don't drop the m word lightly it is a masterpiece then we move on to dawn of the planet of the apes and we stay in great territory here dawn of the planet of the apes explores so now that the humans are starting to suffer with the simian flu and the apes have not just risen up they are a proper force now like they've got functioning societies there are politics within their society there are villains namely koga played by toby kebbell who i think gives one of the most underrated performances ever the fact that people aren't raving about Toby Kebbell in Dawn of the Planet of the Apes is because he was unfortunately acting alongside the goat of motion capture Andy Serkis, who is just on another level to everyone. But Toby Kebbell, as Cobra, is incredible in this movie. This sees this is almost the, the, the proper Julius Caesar story, this one. It sees Caesar's fall and the rise of the Senate, Brutus, and all of that. He gets stabbed in the back and it ultimately ends up with, with a massive fight between him and Koba. But prior to that fight, Koba goes to town on the humans, man. Apes on horses are back. The effects in this movie are incredible. The tension, 
between Cobra and Caesar is is palpable. The tension between the apes and the humans, it, it's, it's just genius, this movie. And it takes what Rise did and then it makes it grander. This has got big scale, this one. The battles are big, the set pieces are big, the characters are larger than life. Top to bottom, this movie works. Dawn of the Planet of the Apes also gets an S ranking. It's the second best in the franchise for me. I adore this movie. Then we get on to War for the Planet of the Apes. And this one broke my heart a little bit because I thought it was a massive, massive step down compared to the last two. We, we did we did a retelling of the Moses story here. Caesar has to s s set the apes free and take them to the promised land. Okay, it's a story I've seen a million times which left me wanting a bit. Woody Harrelson was really, really good in it with the little that he had to do. He has a true hatred of the apes and you understand why. If you're a parent, infinitely relatable. That might be giving away too much. But it just, it, it, this movie felt like one long, overly long, unpolished prison escape movie, which is basically what it is actually. And yeah, it, it didn't work for me, unfortunately. It's it's good. The effects are the best in class until the New Kingdom. But of that new trilogy, the effects were best in class. There were some good scenes in it, but it ultimately left me considering how good Rise and Dawn are, it just left me feeling like, ugh, you go out on a bit of a silent clap, to be honest. It's a B or a C. I don't know where I'm going to fall with this one. Um, you know what? Based on how I've been ranking, I'm going to put War for the Planet of the Apes at a B ranking, but it's a low, low, low B. It's just missing out on the C. The only reason it's not a C is because of Conquest and Battle in this ranking list for a C, and they're just not very great. So yeah, War for the Planet of the Apes, I'll give it a B. Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes. Now, I'm not going to go into long here. We, the video has already been running a while. This is very, very good. It's not as good as the whole internet says. I've done a full review on it. I said at the top, the link to that is below. But do you know what? Go and watch the review. That explains all in this movie. But I'll say this. The Apes franchise is very much back. It's been elevated since War for the Planet of the Apes. Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes, I'm going to give an A ranking to. It's deserving. It's a great story. It's got great characters. The effects are the best we've ever seen from the Planet of the Apes franchise. Obviously, they've done it again. They've set up more movies to come. If rumors are to be believed, there's going to be nine starting with Kingdom. So eight more Planet of the Apes movies. And listen, if they're all this good, bring it on. These are fun movies. But now I want to hear from you guys. What do you think of my ranking list? Do you agree that some movies you would have put higher, lower? How many of these movies have you seen? Let me know down in the description below and yeah tell me also what you think of kingdom of the planet of the apes if movies are your jam subscribe to the silver screen dudes please do like the video it does help me out there should be a subscribe button right here and another video for you to watch up here so please go ahead and do all that and i will see you guys probably at the back end of the summer for another ranking video but stay tuned to the silver screen dudes for more reviews and reactions and things like that but yeah bye for now thank you for watching